morning. Before I start, you bow with me for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise for this morning. Thank you for allowing us to gather together in a free way. And Lord, as we come before you, we pray that you will quieten our hearts and our minds so that we may know and hear what you have to speak to us. Lord, we pray that we will dedicate this hour into your hands and ask that you will speak through your word to accomplish its purpose. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to uh, welcome back Romain and his family, a uh, new baby that was born just barely 10 days ago. And I think for myself, when my kid was born, we, well, my wife and the kid wasn't in the church for at least one month. So uh, it's amazing what you're doing there. As, uh, as the text was, was read, uh, today we're going to be focusing on the second part of the, of the text. Right? And nowadays, it is quite easy to, to search for a job, not to actually find and land a job, but just to search. And there are many recruiters out there, so what they do is that they get their contacts from avenues such as LinkedIn, or through a database, or they get your contacts from a referral, and they call you. They call you and ask you whether you're interested in a role that they have to offer. And from time to time, I get such calls, and after hearing from them, everything that I want to know about the job, I always ask them this particular question that they always give the same answer. Right? I always ask them, how is the boss like? So they always tell me, oh, he's a, he's a really nice person, uh, very, very down to earth. Uh, I place people there and they only have nice things to say about him. And of course, they will not reveal that he is a micromanager or he works late every night or he gives you a lot of trouble if you make a small mistake. Right? And I think it is the same with, uh, with Christianity as well. When we hear about Christianity, we only hear the good things. We don't often associate it with uh, suffering or rejection or hell or punishment. Right? And the first thing when you talk to other people about Christianity, the, the thing that comes to their mind is heaven, right? a city on white clouds, or angels with fluffy wings and halos on their heads, or Christmas or prosperity. And here we have today Jesus as a recruiter over 2,000 years ago. And we see in the responses that we just read that he really didn't mince his words. And he was very truthful and honest about what things would be like if we are to follow him as a disciple. And we see here in the example that there were, there were three men who approached Jesus and these three wanted to be his disciples. And many times when I first read it, I was always uh, thinking to myself whether Jesus was being realistic, right? Didn't he say later on in the chapter that the workers are few and the harvest is plentiful? So why was he so difficult? And when I try to get my kids uh, to follow me to run simple errands, it can be quite a challenge, right? Even getting them to come with me to the supermarket, I have to persuade them on the merits of going there, such as the aircon or you can help me to carry things, and so forth. But even then, it is a challenge. So most times, I just end up doing it myself. Because getting others to follow you can be quite tiring. So the passage that we have here today, the key word is about following. It's all about following, and all about being a disciple of Christ. And here we have the Greek word here, and it means to follow, to accompany, and to follow as a disciple. Before we go into the text, uh, the context that we have here is that Jesus has already twice announced his, to his disciples on his impending rejection and death. And uh, before the verse that we read also, he said that he, the verse said that he had resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem and death. And earlier on in the chapter, he also talked about embracing self-denial and taking up the cross daily. So this forms the context of... Uh, of the, of the text that we have today, and as we go through, let us have these three things in our mind. So the first one, it says here, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. 
So if you can picture with me here, it was that Jesus was walking along the road with his disciples and probably a crowd was following him, uh, listening to him as he talked. And this man, he had heard and saw what Jesus was doing and decided that he wanted to follow him. And back then in Jesus' time, uh, there were many wandering rabbis that were going around, like John the Baptist. And so what happened was that uh, people would follow them. They would leave their jobs or their family to follow this man for a while. So it is similar to what we have here as in our current context as students who go off to college for a few years. And so this man uh, probably have, saw, have seen Jesus and decided that, yeah, I need to follow him. And so after they, they left what they're doing, they'll follow him for a while, doing everything that he does, listening to him. And after they finished doing whatever they need to do, then they will go back to their own, their own lives. And so here comes this man, and he said that he wants to follow Jesus. And in fact, he even said that he, want, he was willing to go wherever Jesus goes. And you see in Jesus' reply, he says that foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And if you are like me, then perhaps you are a little bit disappointed as to how Jesus was responding to this man. Right? It sounds a bit insensitive. Uh, it sounds a bit crude also. And he was practically saying to him that you are going to be following a homeless man. Do you want that? And I think if you, uh, if you look at the, the way that Jesus responded to him, it is almost like killing the joy that a man had of wanting to do it, uh, wanting to follow him. However, we also know that Jesus always speaks things that cut to the heart of a person. And we read in the instance where he talked to the rich young ruler. And so probably this, uh, this sentence to the man has touched a raw nerve. And you can imagine the shock on the man's face. You see, what I think that when the man said that he wanted to follow Jesus was that he was thinking of all the nice things, right? Jesus had all the wise words, uh, miracles at his fingertips, and who can forget the occasional free food that comes along with following Jesus? And he didn't know what he was getting himself into. And Jesus was warning him, and us as well today, that following him is not going to be easy and carefree. And perhaps on a more serious tone, this man probably didn't know who Jesus was, his true identity as the Messiah, as the Son of God, and how serious it was in following him. And following him cannot be a flippant or an emotional decision. It has to be a calculated one and a determined one. And to follow Jesus means that we are definitely going to be taken out of our comfort zone. You might be forsaken by others, rejected, mocked, even persecuted. You might need to take on responsibilities that reveal your weaknesses and so forth. And we don't hear how the man responded, but we can imply that this was a showstopper for him. And here we have a, a quote that I would like to give to you. It says here about Jesus, He would have no man enlisted on false pretenses. He would have it distinctly understood that there is a battle to be fought and a race to be run, a work to be done, and many hard things to be endured if we propose to follow him. Salvation he is ready to bestow without money and without price. Grace by the way and glory in the end shall be given to every sinner who comes to him. But he will not have us ignorant that we shall have deadly enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that many will hate us slander us and persecute us if we become his disciples. He does not wish to discourage us, but he does wish us to know. And speaking about comfort zone, uh, try to think back on a time when being Christian involved you doing something that made you uncomfortable. And a couple of years ago, we had uh, food distribution where we gave food to the underprivileged and the poor. And so what would happen was that we would try to make conversation with, uh, with these people in my broken Mandarin and broken dialect. And I'm embarrassed to say that my group always end up being one of the first to finish. Because what we always did was just smile and give them the food and say, how are you? That's it, right? Because it's very hard for me to converse with them. Eventually, it got a little bit better, but it was very, very difficult for me. And I think living as a Christian isn't meant to be easy. And if your life as a Christian is smooth and plain sailing, 
then I'm afraid that the devil has got you where he wants you to be, to be comfortable. Because it is in comfort that we refuse to grow, that we refuse to mature and refuse to make a difference for Christ. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that as a Christian, our life should be full of hardships. But if we are to look at the lives of Jesus and his disciples, comfort was probably the last thing that they enjoyed. And think about it, we are going against the grain of the world, we are called to do it. Where the world seems, screams prosperity and wealth, the Bible says, build a treasure in heaven. They say, indulge your senses or pamper yourself. But the Bible says, love your enemies. While many wants to legalize abortion, the Bible instead states that each child is fearfully and wonderfully made in the womb. And again, there are many other topics such as terrorism, LBGT, and so forth. We are called to be different, and being different is not going to be comfortable. And so think back on the time when being Christian makes you do something uncomfortable. And maybe for some of us, it involves uh, taking up responsibilities or having the courage to speak to a stranger in church? Or how about just visiting a local congregation when you are on holiday? And when I, when I suggest this to people, I always get the look, you know, that kind of look that makes you feel dirty for even suggesting it, right? Because in their mind, they're thinking, oh, there's a buffet breakfast that runs at 10 and you're telling me that I should go to church? Or the beach is just 50 meters away and you're telling me I should spend half the day in church? Right? So doing things as a Christian is not meant to be easy. It's not meant to be comfortable for us. And there's another quote here that says, there's a difference between interest and commitment. When you're interested in doing something, you do it only when circumstances permit. When you're committed to doing to something, you accept no excuses, only results. So that leaves us with a question that we only can answer. Are we following Christ out of interest or commitment? Are we discharging our Christian obligations out of interest or commitment? And here Jesus made it clear to the men that following him will require him to adopt a similar lifestyle as him, one of poverty and of no permanent dwelling. And we can assume that that was too much for the men. How about for you? What kind of personal comforts are you willing to give up for Jesus? The second point that we have he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. His answer on one level from the man, it seems quite reasonable. Right? In fact, many of you can recall a verse in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. It says, but any, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So this statement from Jesus sounds like it was a contradiction to what was just pure filial piety. And surely we all, need, uh, we all know the need to bury our own parents, right? Which kid would not want to do that for their own parents? But the statement, let me go and bury my father, it does seem very puzzling, right? Because what happens in the first century was that the Jews would typically bury their dead within, uh, within the day, within the few hours. Right? We see in the case of Jesus, of Ananias, and so usually what will happen if, is that in the biblical times when someone dies, is that they will take the body, they will wash it, and they will uh, prepare it by putting ointment, fragrances, and perfumes before they wrap the body up. And after wrapping it up, they will let the families bid their goodbyes before they place the body in a tomb. And after they place it in a tomb, they will seal it. And only after a year, uh, the family will return uh, to, to take the body that has already decomposed. They will collect the bones and put it in a box and place it in another part of the tomb. So here we have, uh, we have the story of the man talking to Jesus. And it's very hard to understand what the man was trying to say. Right? Was he saying that my father passed away at 10? It's 11 now. There's a funeral at 2 o'clock but I can be on the job at 3 o'clock. You know, it is quite, uh, it is likely, but it is not possible. Because what on earth is a man doing following Jesus if his father had just died, right? It doesn't sound very feel as well. So actually, many commentaries have instead taken the, the words to mean that he wanted to look after his father un 
until the father dies before he follows Jesus. And taken from that light, the man was indeed telling Jesus to wait before he follows him. And he was effectively telling him that his father was more important than Jesus. And here we recall again a famous saying of Jesus. He says here, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife, and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't think that Jesus is calling us to hate our family, but the things that we do as a Christians many times will cause our family to think that we hate them. When I first became Christians, uh, a Christian many years ago, uh, it, was, it was very difficult for my, for my parents to accept it. Because simple things such as giving thanks for the food became a challenge. And they will be thinking in their head that I provided you the food and you are giving thanks to someone else. And uh, other things such as holding the joysticks or being apart from them on Sunday mornings. Those things are difficult. But I think that is the price that we are to pay if we want to be a follower of Christ. And I'm sure that many of us here sitting today, we sympathize with, with the man, right? Assuming that this man, uh, his father was still alive, probably quite old, and needs his help. And he wanted to care for him until he dies, right? It sounds quite reasonable. But we know also that this, for this man, Jesus directly called him. And when God calls you, you have no choice but to obey, aged parent or not. Now, it sounds really crude and irresponsible, but I think here Jesus laid bare the man's heart, that it was not wholly dedicated to him. That he placed his love for his family above the love of Christ. And to Jesus, that was unacceptable, because in his heart, in the man's heart, Jesus must be the first one. And he cannot be second place to anything in our lives. And on the throne of our heart, only Jesus must be king and no one else. And we don't have to look very far, but to our CB deans who have left their family to, to migrate here to answer to God's call. And many times, God's call may not involve us to migrate or to move away from our family. But in our society today, the order of our priorities are all messed up. Right? If we think about it, the priorities that we, that we have in our world will look something like work, family, many, many things, hobbies, and then probably last will be God. So how do we know if our family ties are hindering us from God's work? I think it is when we are so emotionally attached to our family that we refuse to leave them, either temporarily or permanently, to carry out God's work. It is when we forsake meeting up with other believers in place of family time. It is when we lower our standards to please our family. Right, we can think of the festive season where there will be many people who want to engage in uh, perhaps gambling or many people talk about Christianity in a derogatory way and we participate in it. Or we make decisions that please our family instead of pleasing God first. Right, and many times when, we asked, uh, when asked to go to serve, to do something for God or to go to camp, or to attend some activity, and we typically hear these kind of responses. And some of these responses are definitely mine as well. Right? They say, well, that's my weekly family dinner time. I visit my grandparents only once a week, and I just can't give that up. Or my kids have enrichment class. Or I have to bring my dog to the vet. These kind of things. Right? And I think it isn't really got to do with our family commitments per se, but it is such that we've, we've packed our life in such a way that God always takes uh, the back seat and when the first thing to go when we are faced with giving up something would probably be the spiritual matters. And I think when we use family as an excuse, we know that it is a legit reason and when we use it, we will not be frowned upon and we will most likely be let off the hook. And like the first point, we are prepared, we're not prepared to go outside of our comfort zone to shift our priorities and schedule around. And when we consider Jesus' response, he says, let the dead bury their own dead. It is not very surprising as well when we think really about what it really means. Because he was just emphasizing how important it is, right? And taken from another light, let the dead bury their own dead can also take, be taken to mean let the spiritually dead to bury the physically dead, right? Let the spiritually dead tend to these mundane tasks while the man is supposed to go and preach God's word. 
And to stretch this even further, Jesus was effectively saying that by not following his commands, we are spiritually dead. And again, we don't know what the man replied, but we can assume that he didn't follow Jesus. So the question, the second question that we have for us today is that are we putting our family ties above our relationship to God? And if someone were to point a gun to your head to say, renounce Christ or else, what would you say? I know it is extreme, but sometimes it is the extreme examples that show who we really are, right? Like the, like the text. The third man that we have, he says to Jesus, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And I think his request does seem the most reasonable of the three. Right? All he does was to bid farewell to his, uh, to his family. Right? Perhaps they will throw him a farewell party. Perhaps, uh, they will say some nice words to him. There will be a few tears shed and so forth. It sounds very reasonable. So why can't he go home and bid his family goodbye? And here this story is remarkably similar to the one that we have in the Old Testament of Elijah and Elisha. It says here in the verse, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed over him and threw his mantle on him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and bought the flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. If it was okay for Elisha, why was it not okay for this man? And I think we will, we will see the answer when, uh, when we think about what plowing really entails. Right, in the olden times, this is what plowing looks like. And to, to guide the animals to plow in a straight line requires a high degree of skill and concentration. It requires you to have uh, quite a bit of strength to control and hold the reins of the animals so that they will not go sideways. Because if they do go sideways, then all your hard work can be undone. So if you look at Elisha, what he, does, what he did was quite remarkable because he, he left what he was doing and ran after Elijah, meaning what he, was, what, we, what he had done throughout the day could have been uh, undone in that, in that moment. And I think those two actions were enough proof to Elijah that he was serious enough about following him. Right? And we also read on in the following text that he eventually did sacrifice the, the oxen and he literally gave up everything to follow Elijah. And in comparison to the verse that we have here today, it seems obvious that the man in the text that we have, he probably had heard about Jesus. Uh, he probably had heard that Jesus was uh, coming to town. And so if he really had intended to follow Jesus, he should have said his goodbyes to his family first before coming to Jesus and said that I want to follow you. So it gives us the impression that the man probably made an impulsive decision and that impulsive decision kind of gives us the impression that he has a distracted mind, a mind that cannot quite make up what he wants. And again, Jesus is greater than Elijah, so probably what was acceptable to the man isn't necessarily acceptable to God. And when Jesus used the analogy of plowing, I think it is in stark contrast to verse 51 that was read earlier. Verse 51 says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And here the author Luke, he was using an Old Testament phrase, right? setting your face towards something. And as the commentary puts it, it says, Strengthen his face, as the Vulgate Latin, uh, Latin and Ethiopic versions. Set his face like a flint, as in Isaiah 1 verse 7 denoting not impudence but boldness, courage, constancy, and firmness of mind. Or he prepared his face as a Syriac, or turned his face as the Arabic. He looked that way and set forward, or as the Persic version renders it, he made a firm purpose. He resolved upon it and was determined to go to Jerusalem, his time being up in Galilee, 
And though he knew that he was to meet with and endure, that he should bear the sins of his people, the curse of the law and the wrath of God, that he should have many enemies, men and devils to grapple with, and undergo a painful, shameful and accursed death. Yet none of these things moved him. He, were, he was resolutely bent on going thither, and accordingly prepared for his journey. So here in verse 51, Luke was actually emphasizing the degree of resolution that, and focus that Jesus had in accomplishing his vision, his mission. And in our term today, it would be called tunnel vision, with only one goal in mind and without distractions. Because looking back or sideways will cause us to veer from our goal. Right? It is the same when you try to drive and text at the same time. Your car will definitely veer to the other lane. And I'm sure many of us have seen this on race horses before. Right? It is put on them so that they will be able to focus on the race, uh, not look sideways and be distracted. And many times I have been very tempted to buy one of these for my sons because they just can't concentrate when they are supposed to eat their meal. Just look everywhere and be distracted. And we see this also in, uh, in competitors before they enter their race, right? They put on headphones and sunglasses in order to block out the noise and distraction from the world so that they can focus, so that they can perform at their peak. So how are we going to stay focused in this world that seeks to distract us at every opportunity? I think the these two things can help us, silence and solitude, as was covered in the Bible class series uh, a few weeks ago. I think we need to find time each day to withdraw from the distractions of the world and just to be able to focus and to realign ourselves, to quiet our mind inside and also in our physical environment, and to just spend that time alone with God and allow Him to minister to you through word or prayer. And I think living in a society like Singapore, it isn't easy at all to find silence and solitude, right? Because there are always things going on at any time of the day. You can hear what your neighbours are doing, and there's always construction nearby. So I think within ourselves, we have to find and decide which part of the day is best for us to find that silence and solitude. And for myself, it is early on in the morning when no one is awake. So I encourage each one of us to use that practice of silence and solitude daily to find a quiet moment to quieten ourselves. And I think it can be a powerful tool to realign ourselves so that we may be able to know what our real purpose is on earth and to be a more effective Christian for God. It allows us to find a moment of peace in this chaotic world and to find the inner strength for us to go through that day. And today we have looked at the passage and the three examples and we have uh, looked at how following Jesus entails uh, being above personal comfort, being above family ties and above all distractions. And I'm sure that if we are honest with ourselves, we probably fall into one of these three categories. Or perhaps you're not a Christian yet and perhaps you want to be a follower of Christ. And would like to know him as your personal saviour. But know this, that Jesus desires our everything, but he was also the first one to give us his life and more, so in the terms of the eternal life that he will give. And so if you would like to respond, please come forward as we sing the invitation song. <laughs>